Hello everybody! So are there any situations where foresight techniques such as scenario planning can do more harm than good in an organization? In other words, can foresight backfire? Well, yes, there are several situations where if foresight is not practiced skillfully, it can actually do more harm than good in an organization. So in this video, I will share with you five such situations. I will talk about five evidence-based pitfalls that you can easily fall into when practicing foresight in a corporate organization, and I'll suggest very practical ways for you to avoid those pitfalls. Those five pitfalls are of increasing seriousness, so make sure to stick until the end of the video to learn more about the most serious pitfall of all at the end. And by the way, this video is designed as a counterbalance to my previous video on the five benefits of foresight in an organization. If that video is about different ways foresight can benefit an organization, this video is all about different ways foresight can harm an organization if it's not practiced skillfully. And it is designed for consultants, facilitators, or practitioners. So let's jump right in. Okay, the first pitfall you may easily fall into when practicing foresight in a corporate organization is to build scenarios that are too extreme and implausible. In fact, from this article, there is evidence that when executives evaluate extreme scenarios, they become even more confident of their original forecast about the future. In other words, foresight techniques such as scenario planning backfire in this situation. They convince executives even more that the future they had thought was going to happen before creating scenarios will in fact happen. This will also contribute to their distrust in foresight techniques in general, by the way. Executives evaluating extreme scenarios might just think that foresight is too up in the air. However, this first pitfall of foresight practice is closely tied to a second and opposite pitfall that I want to share with you. And that second pitfall is building scenarios that are not challenging enough. In fact, we don't need evidence for this. In the experience of almost all consultant facilitators, not challenging enough scenarios are simply discarded by decision makers. In this case, because they might just think the scenarios are pointless. Again, this can also contribute to their distrust in foresight techniques. Okay, so as you might have guessed it by now, the way to avoid these two pitfalls altogether is to strike the right balance between challenging scenarios and plausible scenarios of the business environment around the organization. Scenarios cannot be too extreme, but they also cannot be implausible. So how to achieve this? Well, the best tactic is to choose a mix of organizational members and outsiders of different backgrounds and expertise to make up the team that is going to create the scenarios. That is why it is very common to have so-called remarkable people in scenario planning exercises. These are sci-fi writers, filmmakers or designers, for instance, who might be able to counterbalance the usually more logical and down-to-earth ideas of the members of the organization. Okay, so the third pitfall you may easily fall into when practicing foresight in an organization is showing decision makers already made scenarios rather than requiring them to generate scenarios on their own. In fact, there is a range of evidence, which you can see in this book chapter, that when decision makers are shown pre-prepared scenarios, again, they become even more confident of their original favored view about the future. And that only when they create scenarios on their own, their confidence decreases and they come to appreciate uncertainty, which is what we want to achieve with foresight. So the obvious solution to this is to absolutely require decision makers to generate or at least co-create scenarios on their own. This way they will feel ownership towards the scenarios and they will stretch their thinking as a consequence of it. Okay, so the fourth pitfall of foresight that I wanna share with you is allowing decision makers or scenario planning participants to anchor their judgment on the first scenario considered. In fact, from this article, there is evidence that when decision makers evaluate a positive future of the business environment where their organization will succeed, then it is very difficult to convince them that the future might not be that scenario. 
Anchoring judgment on the first scenario considered might also happen because decision makers spend a lot of time developing that first scenario, regardless of whether it is positive or negative, and then they have less time and energy to develop the others, which as a consequence turn out to be not challenging enough, and so again they are discarded. So the solutions to this that I regularly apply in my workshops are two. First, I ask decision makers to briefly outline each scenario, the relative more positive ones as well as the relative more negative ones, in simple bullet points before developing them in fully fledged complex narratives. And two, I have different members of the scenario planning team develop different scenarios first, and then I shuffle the scenarios among the team for review and improvement. In my experience, these techniques are excellent to avoid the bias of anchoring to the first scenario considered. Okay, so finally we got to the last and also most serious pitfall of all I'm sharing with you today. And that is allowing the organization where foresight is practiced, or better, its decision makers, to show defensive avoidant behaviors during the foresight intervention, such as absence, ridicule, disengagement, skepticism, or even open attempts to sabotage the intervention. Now, when this happens, it is usually because they just cannot stand the high level of stress involved in rethinking their deeply held views about the future, or even rethinking the strategy of the organization, as explained in this article. Now, this absolutely cannot be allowed to happen because it hurts the reputation of the facilitator, you, it hurts the reputation of the practice of foresight, and ultimately, it also kills the trust of the organization in foresight too. Okay, so how to avoid this? Well, because this is a complex challenge, the solution is also complex to implement. But in short, it boils down to enabling an open, explicit, relational level dialogue about potential unleashing of emotions in the foresight intervention. And that dialogue is to start from the very beginning of the foresight process, from the framing stage, the very first part of foresight, as I explained in this video about framing. That dialogue will tactfully discuss what's appropriate, what's not, clarify expectations, and generally build mutual trust between the consultant facilitator and the decision makers in the organization who are going to be the participants of the foresight intervention. Now, if you're interested in this particular pitfall, stay tuned for an article I am writing about it with my co-author, Jared Hodgkinson. Eventually, we will paste a link to it in the show notes of this video. All right, I really hope this video was helpful for you to understand how foresight can actually harm an organization and its decision makers if it's not practiced skillfully. Obviously, this can happen in a number of different ways. What I shared with you was just what I believe are the major pitfalls. If you think that this video delivered any value to you, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It would really mean a lot to me and I will see you in my next video. Bye.